Easier said than done. Well, good morning, there. Good morning, everyone. Let me get this right here. Let's just take a quick moment to pray. God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we pray your presence will be here this morning. We pray that we will come to know you in a greater way, but also know ourselves in a greater, more challenging way. In your name, amen. I was at a physiotherapy session um, recently, and uh, I don't know if you've ever been to one, but they're not always the most fun. <laughs> Some of the things that they have, you do kind of a bit of a wear on you, but I was at my physiotherapy, and my, uh, my physiotherapist, Craig, I noticed this tattoo on my arm, rehumanize. And he asked me what it meant, and because I, I, I often get that, but uh, so I shared with him you know, what it represents and what it, uh, what it means to me. And um, after I shared this, uh, um, he paused and he asked me, how are you doing this? And um, this question kind of caught me off guard, to be honest. You know, the idea of rehumanizing, we're going to get to develop that a little bit more, but the idea of, of, of rehumanizing, um, as a society, we have a history of dehumanizing people. When we think less of someone or marginalize them in any way, it eases our conscience and allows us to push them down. What I've come to learn that is it's not enough for us to stop dehumanizing people. It's our responsibility to rehumanize them. And I, I had the privilege of being able to share that, uh, share that with Craig. And um, while he didn't have the privilege of having me sit back for a couple weeks and, and prepare it in a little bit more of a sermon format, we did share a lot. And at the end of it, um, he acknowledged that there were some good points I made. And he went on to, to further expand some of his ideas of how he sees how we can rehumanize um, society and those that are around us. And I want to look at a couple things. Uh, first, are some, some big picture ways that, um, that we can look at rehumanizing and the, the idea of what it means. In recent months, Canadians are becoming aware, possibly for the first time, how much our systems marginalize whole groups of people. We have heard the cries of our black brothers and sisters as they point out the hardships that they are faced and continue to face. Many of us have responded by joining in with the Black Lives Matter. It was a, a hashtag that hopefully is becoming more than just a hashtag for us. We're beginning to listen and understand. And that's amazing, but listening is not enough. It's no longer good enough for us to say, um, I will not support a system that is built on racism. We do need to stop pushing our brothers and sisters down, stop the dehumanizing but more importantly, we need to be part of the movement to begin rehumanizing. Rehumanizing says, let me hear your story. It gives back a voice to those who have been silenced. The act of rehumanizing one another looks like the privilege choosing to be quiet enough to hear the voices of the other. We can't change the past but we have the responsibility to change the present. This, I believe, is in part what Jesus is declaring in Luke chapter 4. He's liberating the oppressed, rehumanizing the dehumanized. We're going to touch on that passage a little bit more in a few moments, but I just want to recognize that that's really what he is sent to do, liberate the oppressed and rehumanize the dehumanized. Likewise, we have been grieving as a nation as we continue to hear of the mass graves of indigenous children being found at former residential schools. This should make us feel shame and anger. Where were the Christians when all this was happening? Some believe that they were following the teachings of the traditions of their forefathers by assuming that their ways were better than the ways of an entire civilization. Many believe that they were saving people from themselves, but schools should never have graves. We, as the corporate church, need to repent of this and vow to never let it be repeated again. We need to stop dehumanizing our indigenous brothers and sisters and begin the long road to rehumanizing. We need to stop and listen. We ignored the fundamental character of God when we failed to love. 
Once again, we can't change the past, but we can change the present, and we most certainly need to change the future. As a privileged white man, I'm hesitant to even speak of these things. It's so easy for me uh, and those in similar situations to feel that we have all the answers, and we tend to co-opt the process, thinking that we are the only ones that can swoop in and fix the problem. I need to caution myself to not develop a savior complex. We need to work on this together. You see, when we dehumanize someone, we dehumanize ourselves in the process. The act of rehumanizing those we have harmed actually rehumanizes both of us. A third quick example I wanted to highlight was uh, the conditions of the poor and the homeless and street engaged right in our own city here of Halifax. We are witnessing a tremendous tragedy right before our eyes. This transcends any one level of government or any one political party. The problem is not the poor. Forcing people to leave tents and temporary shelters and move them away from the public eye does nothing to rehumanize those that are being dehumanized right before us. It makes me happy to see that there are some people who are standing up in solidarity and saying, enough, let's fix this issue. As Christians, we need to ask how we can use our position to be part of the solution. Part of my purpose, my goal in life, is to shine a light on these things and to be a voice of those, for those who have no voice. For those that uh, follow the, the blog I share, and I, I wrote a poem a few months ago, and I, w- I want to share it because I think it, it really highlights for me the message of, of rehumanization. It says, I have eyes, let me see. Let me see the hurt around me. May my eyes not just take a cursory glance, an obligatory surveying of the world around me. Let me see the true condition of the hurting and marginalized. Let me remove the lens of convenience enough to focus and genuinely view without passing judgment on those which lie before me. I have ears, let me hear. For months, days, weeks, even years, they have cried and I didn't hear. It wasn't that I didn't want to hear, it's just that I had so many more jovial sounds to fill my ears. You said you were hurting, you whispered you were forgotten, you cried that you were abused. I, we, all of us wouldn't listen. Please speak again, our ears need to hear. I have a mind, let me think. For too long we have taught who is worthy and who is not. Our institutions create a doctrine of convenience and comfort for those within. They ever so convincingly tell us the truth to believe. These are the rules of the game. If by chance the rules won't, doesn't allow the house to win, they change them and a new truth is revealed. I have a mind. Let me take the information I have and think for myself. If the rules don't allow me to understand the humanity of those around me, then they need to be challenged. May my mind think, think like a victim and not just a victor. I have a heart, let it beat with compassion. For too long my heart has been hard. For too long love, caring, empathy have vacated my heart, leaving nothing but emptiness. The poor, the homeless, the hurting and abused, the exploited and marginalized have no place in my heart. May my heart break for what breaks yours. As long as you feel the pain, let my heart be joined with you. Let them beat together as one. I have a voice, let me speak. I am a white man who lives a life of privilege. I speak and I am heard. Society has robbed you of your voice, so take mine. For generations my lips have been silent, unable and unwilling to speak of the pain you suffer. When the world chooses to ignore your voice, use mine. Let me see that which is reality and not just that what I'm told I should see. Let my ears hear the truth, no matter how difficult it is to hear. Let me think on these things and form my own opinions. Then let those thoughts move me into action, to change not only me, but those who surround me. May my heart beat for you who are hurting, and may not stop until your pain is gone. May I choose to speak and no longer accept silence as an acceptable course of action. I didn't share that poem with Craig, but it was pretty cool to be able to share with him this whole idea of, of these big picture uh, ways 
of rehumanizing. And um, um, Craig, uh, after we had talked, you know, he took my lead and he told of many ways he feels we can, in his opinion, make an impact on society. These big picture items, though, are hard for us to quantify in our day to day lives. They may feel big and daunting to try and fix. The problems have taken years to develop, and unfortunately, there isn't a quick fix that can be provided to, to wipe away all these problems and make them better. The amazing thing is, though, is that the transformation happens as much in the process as it does in the end reaction and in solution. When we are part of it, we all change, we all grow, we are all rehumanized. Setting aside the big picture items for a moment, I'd like to point out and challenge us to recognize that there are many more personal ways for us to be agents of rehumanization. And this is really the exciting part for me. Maybe it's a phone call to someone who is str- who a friend who is struggling. Maybe it's a conversation with a barista at the local coffee shop. Maybe it's offering to look after your neighbor's kids so that they can go out on a much-needed date. I don't know what it would look like in your experience, but I'm beginning to, lo- to learn and understand what it looks like in mine. Most mornings, I pop over to the grocery store across the street from my work, and uh, every, almost every morning, there's a, a fellow there named Bill, and I, good, I was a little enthusiastic, good morning, Bill, and he always responds with, good morning, Mr. Colon. Mr. Colon, I don't know why, but Mr. Colon. Um, we will, as I'm going through the checkup, we'll, we'll often chat about things that are going on in our lives. I remember one day he got choked up as he told me about his sick mother. That's a vulnerability you don't just get. It's cultivated over time. And for a brief moment in his busy day, I had a chance to come alongside him and provide a little bit of encouragement. I have another fellow that I I talk or text with almost every day. He lives on his own, and he he just needs to know that someone is there out there who cares. He recently found a new job, and I I was so proud of him, and I let him know it. And isn't that something that we all really need? To know that someone sees us, hears us, cares for us. To have someone say that they see the good and the bad that we're experiencing and are proud of us, whether we beat the circumstances or not. In a world that often pushes us down, there's always someone who needs someone to come alongside and lift them up. This is what it means to rehumanize people. It's also when you're going through this too important to remember that no one likes to feel like they're a project or, or, or for someone who, who, who's just a series of tasks and obligations. They should never feel that way. Rehumanizing needs to happen from a place of authentic care and compassion. When I feel that Jesus, while I feel that Jesus would most certainly be involved as an advocate for change in some of these big picture items, I don't feel that he, his focus would be exclusively on those big examples I gave. I think the smaller, more personal examples are very important to him as well. As a follow up to my initial conversation with Craig, I went back a few weeks later and then gave him an update. I laughed as I pointed at the tattoo on my arm and I said, Hey, Craig, remember how we talked about this a few weeks ago? You challenged me, and I didn't like it. We both laughed as I gave him an update about my life. As many of you know, uh, Joanne and I were foster parents for uh, a couple years ago for uh, for a number of different babies that we had had in our home. And I won't lie, it was it was tough physically and emotionally um, to take on that role. Um, We needed to take a bit of a break, though, and um, because we were just exhausted, and just our life things had changed in our life to the point that it was, it was a challenge that uh, that we couldn't um, really endure at the time. A few days after my conversation with Craig, we were contacted by a mother whose children were just taken into care by protective services. She asked Joanne if we'd be willing to take them in. As Joanne was explaining the situation to me, so that we could decide what to do. I looked down my arm and saw my tattoo. And Craig's words rang in my ears. How am I doing this? We didn't make the decision lightly, but we did realize that this is exactly what it meant to step in and help rehumanize a whole family. We can be a help to a young couple, parents right now that are in need. We can provide two little children with a home that will provide love and the stability needed 
to process the trauma that they're going through right now. I looked at Craig, he just shook his head, and he said, how am I supposed to top that? And I replied, you don't. You just do what you're asked to do with the life that you have and the opportunities that you're given. That's all we can, any of us can do. We are all given opportunities, and we have an opportunity, or we have a responsibility to step up in whatever way we can. That really is the key. We need to be willing to have the courage to do what we can with the resources we have to impact as many lives as we can. And I think that you know, Jesus shows us that key. He expands upon that. This is exactly what Jesus was doing. Jesus was and is seeking to rehumanize us. Compassion, love, these are things he taught and displayed. Isn't that the point of the Sermon on the Mount? Isn't that the reason for the red letters in scriptures? He lived it and taught it by taking the seemingly small moments to pause and look someone in the eyes, touch them, or just listen to them. He spent time with the untouchables and the rejected because they needed to understand that they are humans, beautiful creations of God, no matter what the world around them says. And is he any different to us? Why is it so important for him to to display compassion and love? Because these are the key mechanisms that God will utilize to liberate us. We aren't robots created to be cold and calculated following a set of binary rules. We are meant to live and thrive in relationship, companionship. This is only possible through compassion and love. It's what makes us fully human. When we stifle or deny that, deny that fullness of, of compassion and love, we begin the process of dehumanizing ourselves as well as others. We need a liberator, and Jesus is that liberator. I referenced Luke chapter 4 a little earlier. Let me read the verses so you can have a better, better of an understanding. Luke uh, 4, verses 16 and 22 says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom... He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He enrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And all the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus came to liberate or free those of us who were oppressed. Just as importantly, though, he came to liberate us from being the oppressors. The time is now. Notice he declares that today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Right now, he's declaring the year or the time of God's favor. This is the time of rehumanizing. And really, Jesus is the master rehumanizer. Jesus consistently cared for the poor, sick, and marginalized. He went against cultural norms and expectations, even if it meant rehumanizing individuals. Society, whether within the walls of the church or not, or out in the surrounding world, has a tendency to label people and put a value on them based on their traditions and biases. James continues on with the concepts of Jesus, bringing about liberation and giving us an example of what true religion can and should be. And we read that in James verses one, uh, chapter 1, verses 17 and 27. It says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer but who, who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this, person, religious, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this to visit the orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. That last verse read in the message says, anyone who sets himself up as religious 
by talking a good game is self-deceived. This kind of religion is hot air and only hot air. Real religion, the kind that passes muster before God the Father is this. Reach out to the homeless and loveless in their plight and guard against corruption from the godless world. This is what Jesus was focused on, liberating the poor and marginalized and oppressed. As our act of true worship, this should be our focus as well. Rehumanize those who have been dehumanized. It's, isn't this the essence of the golden rule? Um, the main passage, though, that brought me to this on this path earlier um, is uh, Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to 13. And I'm just going to read this briefly. If you want to turn to it, you're welcome to. Um, Mark 7, verses 1 to 13 says, Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they, thought, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless their hands are washed properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they came from the marketplace, or when they come from the marketplace, they did not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do, you, why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders, but eat with, hands, with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. We are reminded here in Mark 7 that the Pharisees worshipped God with the rules and traditions that made life and essentially God more predictable. Unfortunately, no matter how sincere they were, this approach only succeeded in removing compassion and love. It provides no way for God to truly be God. It turns the relationship into a transactional obligation. And it, it, it negates the humanity that, is, that we, we experience, and it really makes God smaller. These are examples of putting traditions ahead of true, uh, the examples of putting tr traditions ahead of true knowledge and worshiping of God. It makes one think, how have we been doing similar things to people today, both as individuals and collectively as whole groups? Traditions have great power, and that power cannot be underestimated. There is tremendous emotional factor to be considered. Emotions that lead to, at times, unquestionable certainty and loyalty. We are creatures who appreciate our comfort and have a tendency to resist change, often stubbornly denying the need for change at all. Duane often reminds me that I don't like change. In fact, the only change I like is the stuff that jingles in my pocket. I, I like what I like. When I find something I like, I'm very comfortable in that. Hands up if you park in the same spot when you go to the grocery store. Um, who drives the same route every day because they find comfort in that? Even if there's traffic, I will still stay in that same spot as a void because it's what I'm used to. Even here at Grace Chapel, how many of you sat in the same seats or same sections for years? And how would you react if suddenly we told you had to move to another spot? You know, these are silly examples, but, but what if, yeah, they, they kind of highlight to some degree um, what the point I'm trying to make. What if following these traditions dictated everything about you and how you fit into the hierarchy of society? Uh, this, that's the context that many of the Pharisees found themselves in. They, they were, they, the more devout they were, the more that they followed the traditions and the examples through the letter, the, the, the higher they moved up in society. Their entire worth in society was based on following traditions and rules. If you remove those traditions and rules, then they became no different than the sinners and publicans and harlots and those that are on the streets. And it's a scary place to be in. 
And that's why, and that's why Jesus was so scary because he looked at every single person with the eyes of love. He was trying to instill the truth that every single person was loved of God regardless of what they did. And this is really what's important to God because his love for us knows no bounds. The truth of this becomes lost, though, when we put traditions ahead of love and compassion. Um, the final verse of that passage we read in Mark 7, I, did, I skipped over, I'll read it here now. It says, And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you have gained from me is Corbin, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God, thus making the, the word of God void by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. Are there ways that we're doing this now? Are there ways that um, we as, as individuals and as a corporate church are doing those very same things? I think some of those big examples that we dealt with may be an indicator that we are, if, if not as a church, at least as a society. Traditions, doc doctrines, statements of creed, these are, are, can certainly have their place in our lives, aided us in not only knowing God, but displaying God. Traditions, though, as we have seen in the examples of Jesus as, as highlighted, can be manipulated and twisted to the point that they no longer resemble the essence of what brought them in the, in the first place. When we place the importance of traditions above the human before us, we miss in the point and start down that slippery slope of dehumanization. John 3.16 says, For God so loved. God so loved. Love, compassion, grace, these should be what define us not only as individuals, but as the church as well. May we have eyes, ears, mouths, hearts, and minds to seek to know Jesus as liberator and rehumanizer. And may we seek to work alongside him in doing the same for others. Amen.